welcome everyone to the CX Green Room, where we bring in the heavy hitters from the customer experience industry to share their expertise. I'm Ginger Conlon, Thought Leadership Director, with co-host Claire Beattie, who is Director of Thought Leadership, uh, Senior Director of Thought Leadership at Genesis. And our special guest today is Andrew George, who is Director of Direct and Integrated Marketing at the Canadian Red Cross Society. And he is going to tell you all about how Canadian Red Cross Society is using journey analytics as a critical tool for understanding donor experiences, optimizing processes, and making deci deci better decisions that improve donor retention, loyalty, donation increases, et cetera. Great story. Um, so, you know, if you're not familiar with journey analytics, or even if you are and want to learn more, Andrew is the perfect person to ask. So throw all those questions in the chat. And we'll get to those as we can throughout the show. And um, so welcome, Andrew. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your role. Hi, Ginger. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Andrew George. I'm the Director of Direct and Integrated Marketing at the Canadian Red Cross. I've been at the organization for 14 years now, so I've, I've seen a lot um, going on since that time. My current responsibilities include running the direct mail program as well as direct marketing integration and our customer experience program. Um, and so I say this with no ego, but you've probably heard of our brand, uh, the Red Cross. We're a nonprofit organization and we're part of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement. Well, we're so glad to have you here. And, you know, as a heavy hitter celebrity in the industry, we expect that, you know, in the green room, you're going to have a specialty item. And uh, I was very excited about this item. Probably one of my favorites from all the green room items so far. So tell us about what it is and why you chose it. Yeah, um, I was also um, pretty excited about this. I, I did choose a, a Dairy Queen Blizzard. Um, I, I can't say it's how I start every day. It is nine o'clock in the morning here in, in Vancouver, uh, Canada, but uh, super excited. It's, it's it's still pretty hard. I just took it out of the freezer, but uh, pretty excited to eat afterwards. And you know, if, if you in the audience aren't familiar with the Dairy Queen Blizzard, what, what they do when they hand it to you, it's starts with their soft serve ice cream. They put all kinds of stuff inside and then they hand it to you like this <laughs> and then, you know, and give it back. So, uh, so we, we all have um, chocolate stuffed with brownies, chocolate chips and all other goodness that we'll be digging into when y'all aren't looking. Well, from the UK, I have the small uh, chocolate haagen -Dazs, but uh, no complaints here. So good choice, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and in case you didn't catch this on the overview of the show, we have arranged a Benevity matching campaign to support all of the fantastic work um, that the Red Cross is doing uh, in communities across Canada. So we'll be matching uh, up to $1,500 between now and the 15th of September. Um, so one of my colleagues will pop a link into the chat. So if you do uh, want to support the campaign, uh, you'll have the link right there. Excellent. So thanks for that, Claire. Um, should we dive in? Let's do it. So, um, so Andrew, you are using journey management to better understand and improve the journey, uh, the donor journey, as I was saying earlier. So tell us exactly what journey management is for those who might not be familiar and why you decided to use it. Sure. So journey management is the commitment to analyzing and understanding all the ways your customers, donors, prospects, uh, stakeholders interact with your brand. And importantly, it's from their perspective. So, you know, you really want two way communication, two way conversation rather than just us to them all the time. So you need to understand their goals and challenges as they try to succeed with whatever they're trying to accomplish with your brand. For us, we're looking at donations. So making that easy, removing challenges, providing information where it's necessary. And it's a conscious decision to move away from just a channel based kind of one off analysis. And that still certainly has its merit, but you're looking at all of your touch points holistically. So whether that's directional in terms of your direct marketing, if it's advertising, anything like that, you're trying to understand how those holistic touch points add up to your, your customer or donor experience. And it's it's really defining what matters to your organizations, like what a successful journey looks like, what are the pathways your customers or donors are taking to get where you want them to get or not, where are they falling out and how can you fix that? And so 
We chose journey management because we're a big complex organization operating in a very big country. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways that a, the public or a donor can interact with our brand. And like a lot of big organizations, we have numerous data sources, we have lots of legacy systems, and we needed a way to make sense of all of the touch points and interactions that, you know, hopefully we're leading people to donate. Andrew, can I just pick up on something you said? You, you said um, looking at it from the donor's perspective as opposed to like the organizational perspective. What are some of the key differences there? You really have to look at it empathetically. Um, so I have a design thinking background. So um, and I had to learn to do that, right? Like I had to learn, you know, how somebody was trying to interact with our brand. And so sometimes no matter where you work, you have to forget about where you work for that moment and think about how you act as a consumer um, or a donor in, in our case. And how irritated are you if you have to wait on hold for 15 minutes, especially for us? Like, we can't make somebody wait to give us money where they're not buying anything from us. So, and there are other options out there if we make it difficult. Um, so we really have to understand, you know, where the pain points are. Did, there, did they fill out, you know, all of their donation information and the website crash? That's a really good way to lose out on somebody who wants to support you. So again, to build proper experiences, you have to look at it from your, your customer's perspective. Otherwise, and I'll talk to this later, you're often solving problems that don't exist. You're not attacking the actual pain points that your, your consumers are having. That's such a great point. Um, you know, so you've you've actually also said previously when we were prepping for the show that journey analytics helps you understand the truth about interactions. So tell us a little bit more about that. I love that. Yeah. Um, so what I really like about journey analytics is it can help you create journeys, but also micro journeys. So the moments in time that can make or break a relationship with a consumer or a donor and your organization. So we call them the in journey signal. So kind of that tipping point where somebody's going to go one direction or the other, you know, for better or for worse. Um, for some people, it could be a bad call center experience. In other industries, it might be a great retail experience or dining or something like that. And so for us, our team discovered a key moment for our, our monthly donors. So people who commit to giving to the Red Cross on a, a monthly recurring basis. And our, our main channel to acquire donors who do that is what we call face-to-face. -face. So you've probably seen these in your, in your own homes, people knocking on doors, canvassers, or in subway stations. And their goal is to sign up recurring monthly donors. They'll say, you know, do you have a moment for the Red Cross or the SBCA or, or something like that? And what we discovered when we deconstructed that journey down to a micro level with journey analytics was just how critical the actual canvasser experience was. So we formerly, and when we talk about solving problems that didn't exist, and we built retention metrics, sorry, retention journeys, retention onboarding series. But what we ended up finding when we broke this down was the key experience was actually that, you know, 10 to 15 minutes with the actual canvasser. And what we found is it actually had, it made no difference what we did afterwards, um, you know, to retain that donor, you know, in the first three to six months, um, if they had a bad experience with a canvasser. And unlike your call centers, you can't record these. These are not played back. You know, we don't evaluate the canvassers that way. So once we broke that journey down, we really started to understand, we implemented our, our onboarding survey um, almost immediately after that donor was signed up. And that's where we would get the truth about those interactions. And so we hear great things, you know, the person was passionate, you know, they, they were excited to work for the Red Cross. But we also heard, well, they didn't tell me this was a monthly donation until right at the very end, or they told me it would stop after three months. So we had to get those kind of you know, deceitful comments out to make sure that we are really acquiring people that really wanted to commit. Just like any other industry, there's a cost to acquire a customer and there's a break even point. So it's better for us to not sign somebody up than it is to sign somebody up who's going to give for one or two months. So those are, again, you know, we don't, there's no bad donors, but certainly in terms of who we want to sign up for the monthly recurring donors. And we want people who understand this is a long term commitment. And so journey analytics allowed us to do that uh, by breaking that journey up. Um, so Canadian Red Cross, like every organization, has a lot of different interaction channels. How do you use journey management across all those different channels and tools? Sure. So we built out um, a four step process um, to work with journey management and, and journey analytics. Um, and so step one, um, really critical, especially when you're working with other stakeholders in, in the organization and other channels, was identifying the business goals. And again, that description of success, both for the business uh, and for your customer. And that's what you want to marry up for those two things. 
Um, step two was then defining the journeys, how somebody got there, what success looked like for them, the micro journeys, like I just talked about, what channels are involved in that, you know, email, direct mail, you know, your telemarketing, paid advertising, all that kind of stuff. And then the data sources um, where all of that data is housed. And this is typically where things fall down. Um, if you don't have really intense, you know, dedication to detailed design are the data sources. Um, because then when you move into step three and you're connecting and validating the data sources and building out the journey analytics and you know for us that software was was pointless by genesis uh and so we would take all of those data sources and pull them into uh into point list so that we could visualize all of those touch points and again get a really good idea of what those holistic journeys look like and lastly if you can accomplish all of that you're deploying and optimizing your journey you're analyzing it with dashboards over time you're sharing that with uh, a cross-functional team because you need to have that team of people who can actually then implement your findings and implement the recommendations based on those journeys. Thanks, Andrew. And give us a day in the life of working with using these journey management tools. Sure. I mean, I'd say there's really no two days that are the same, but it really depends on where we're at in our, our development cycle. So, you know, we might be scoping a journey, which means, again, that intense data discovery and, and validation and, you know, where are the gaps, you know, that we're, we're never going to be able to analyze and do we have enough to go on, you know, to proceed with that journey. Uh, and, you know, with that business's priorities within the organization, we may be reviewing the dashboards because we're on the other end of the of the journey management. And so looking again for those insights and sharing that, you know, with our, our team and, and channel experts. Um, and I'd say my favorite, you know, when there's time to do it, is just honestly poking around, just asking hypothetical questions of the tool. So that's another great thing about journey analytics is it allows you to build and test hypotheses. And it doesn't always mean they're statistically significant in that moment, but it often gives you enough to go on. Um, I'll just give you a quick example. You know, when, when COVID started, there were a lot of people coming to our website. And so our website is not the type of website um, where people are constantly coming back. You know, we're not selling cars, you know, we're not, uh, you know, a cell phone plan or something like that, that kind of account. But a lot of people during COVID were coming to the Red Cross as a source of information. And then what we found just anecdotally were people were actually giving donations after consuming content on our blog. Uh, so that was interesting that a relatively high number of people were doing that, but we weren't asking them to do it. So, you know, it was about 15 minutes worth of work and within 24 hours, we put a donate now button within all of our blogs that led to the, you know, to the COVID sites or the micro sites. And, you know, we, we saw, you know, a $25,000 increase just in one day. So 15 minutes worth of work, you know, we, we more than doubled our conversions just again, from one little hypothesis and we have plenty that didn't work. Don't get me wrong, but for the minimal amount of work it took to execute on that, it was well worth it. Yeah. That's really, really cool that you can kind of poke around and have different ideas and explore things. Absolutely. Yeah. That's such a great outcome. Um, you know, so you've been working, Andrew, with journey management tools for a long time, since 2018. What's some advice you have for others in customer experience just starting out with it or thinking about it? Yeah, I'd say there's a lot of work to do internally at your organizations, unless you're, you're, you're fortunate enough that your leadership are the ones, you know, um, handing it down to the team. Um, so there's a lot of buy in to build for us. And so, you know, something that, you know, we had to do was define a journey again versus a content strategy. Um, so a content strategy like an onboarding series obviously has its uses and its purpose, but it's not a journey. It's not empathetic. It's not looking at it from from that you know consumer's um, point of view. And again, you end up building, spending a lot of time building content and executing, um, you know, for things that maybe your consumers just don't care about. Um, and so without really understanding, you know, what it is they want in a, in a given moment in their journey. So that's really important that you get on the same page with some of these uh, definitions. Uh, I'd say looking for the quick win. So that blog example I gave was a really quick win that we could show minimal time investment um, and you know money coming in the door almost immediately. So when you're trying to build buy-in from some of those teams who don't necessarily report to you, but you know you want to work with because they control, say, some of those channels of deployment, building wins and helping their budgets and their goals was something that helped move the needle for us. Um, empowering users to accomplish their goals. Um, so, you know, we're trying to have a more cross-functional use of a point list and journey analytics to let people, again, ask their own questions. You know, I have a very good understanding of all of the channels that people give through at the Red Cross, but I'll never know it, know them as well as the people who work in those channels every single day. But if I can empower them to ask those questions and use their own data in this platform, plus appending to other data, you know, again, that's a great way to build that buy-in. 
testing hypotheses and we talked a little bit about that just again just questions you might have you know did, did this affect this did the timing affect you know a transaction you know did a particular experience make any kind of difference you know test that and then build out you know the the real a b test to, to see if you can actually put some meat on the bone there and then just being open to being wrong um, you know, it's really easy to look for information that supports your hypotheses, but uh, it's it's also really important to be surprised. And sometimes, you know, you can make really positive changes, even if you're wrong about what you thought was having an impact. That's an interesting thought. Do you have any examples of like when you've been surprised? Yeah. So one of the first things we mapped out in, in Pointless, probably way back in, in 2018, we had just come up with this really cool campaign for the holidays. So in, in most nonprofits, the holidays are when most people give their donations. And so we built up this really neat experiential online experience where donations were tangible. So a hundred dollars, you know, was the equivalent of something the Red Cross would use in a disaster response, you know, whether it's blankets or your shelter or something like that. And so, you know, you've probably seen examples like that in other places and it was really neat, um, you know, the way that you could, you know, you could do that experience. But we, we, we analyzed it um, and we compared it to just a straight up donation form. And what we found is this really neat creative experience was decreasing giving versus a static donation page that had no experience. And so the question is why, um, you know, why was it having that impact after we'd all spent all this time and all of this, you know, thought and creativity and putting it into this experience. Um, and it was because, or it was what we think it was because it took two and a half times to complete the donation through this experience than if you had just gone to a landing page. And then we had to ask, well, who are we talking to? Most of the people giving give every year. They give every year at this time. They didn't need an experience. You know, and it reminded me really quickly of this one CX experience that I read about at a bank where this bank was committed to being the friendliest, most polite banking experience that you would have. And after a few months, their scores were all really poor. And when they really dug into why that was the case, it was because a lot of people were coming to the bank and they just they're coming with their lunch breaks. They didn't have a lot of time for chit chat and they just needed to get in and get out. And that's the analogy that we use with this campaign. Mm -hmm. People just wanted to support us. We didn't need to make it hard. Um, and so, mm -hmm. again, we, we talk about, you know, creating a solution for a problem that didn't exist. And this was a perfect example of that. So we were at least able to nip that in the bud and again, make it easy you know, for that donor. And anecdotally, we did see that new new donors to the organization were more open to that experience because maybe they did require a little bit more convincing. They didn't have that same affinity. But for the majority of people who give to us every year, they, they just needed an easy way to give us money. Mm -hmm. So those, those consumer um, benchmarks are still there, still the convenience and speed and those yeah. kind of things. Yeah, speed is so important. Just making it easy. Uh, even being a nonprofit, there are other options, especially in the holidays. I mean, there's a, a, most charities are soliciting at that point. And if you make it difficult, I mean, impact always is important for, for a nonprofit. You do need to be able to share that. But, you know, when we did some interviews following with donors, they would say, just take my money. Just take my credit card. Don't ask me for anything else. Later, you can do that. But right now, if I'm giving you money for the first time, just take it. <laughs> just take my money. Basically, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to uh, throw in a, a related question. You've been talking about working across channels and how um, you, you've you've basically blanketed your channels with with journey management and optimization, and then you've got teams working on their specific channels. Have you come across any um, learnings that if you would have changed something here, it might have had like an unintended consequence over there? Kind of similar to the story that you that you were telling? I mean, if you don't have clear definitions of, of what you're looking for, that you can certainly go down some rabbit holes. And again, it's, it's fun sometimes to go down those rabbit holes. But while you're trying to work with those other teams, you know, you need to be direct and you need to really scope the project well. If you don't scope your data requirements, again, that's where it falls down. Like Journey Analytics is one of our tools. Like it's not our entire CX program. It's, it's one of our tools and how we measure those, those different experiences and touch points. But you do need to have a clear idea of, of what the journey is you're building. And again, what these other teams are getting out of it. So again, if you can show quick wins, you know, how much effort is required and what's the ROI. So it's, it's really important that we found it, get it all down on paper, but then work with those teams, you know, what are your top one, top two things um, to do rather than your top 50, you know, we mapped out probably 150 different journeys in our, our journey tracking, but we only moved ahead with about five of them because they were the ones that were the most important and the ones that we could actually implement. So execution was everything on that. So Andrew, what, tell us what's next. 
I would really like for us to further build out and understand so loyalty lead measures um, for, for donors. So, you know, in a lot of other corporate organizations, if you sign up for a newsletter or something, it's a lead measure that likely means you're going to have a higher lifetime value. We want to do more of that type of testing. So, you know, one of our hypotheses we want to look at is donors will call in or email us and tell us that they're moving. And so to us, that is a really high commitment. If somebody is changing, you know, physical mailing addresses, but they're calling to tell us, they obviously care enough um, to, to inform us because most people don't, right? Uh, it's the same as people whose credit cards are going to expire. If they've called us, that's a very high level of affinity. And so we're not doing enough with those donors right now. Um, the ultimate goal of any nonprofit is to get somebody to leave a donation in their will. And if you can identify those signs of commitment, but then roll that into some kind of automated you know, series or alert where you know some of our, our plan giving advisors, you know, plan giving is about giving in a will, can then contact those people um, who are showing affinity. Like we think that's kind of the next level for us is, is taking all of those little data points, which I'll, I'll call it what it is, it's a pain to have to try to track, but it, it's well worth it if we can find a systematized way to track that and actually do something with it so that it's not just a hypothetical, it's something we can actually test out. Yeah, just looking at all those little small things that tell you that someone's actually really loyal, capitalizing on that. Yeah, and there's no silver bullet, right? There's lots of things we'll test that, that don't mean anything, but but we feel those are the kind of things that if somebody's going out of their way to share information with us, you know, there's a really good chance that, you know, maybe we can deepen their commitment. Mm -hmm. We've got a question just come in and I'll um I'll I'll try and summarize quickly. So um Sometimes in the UK, where I am as well, um, you know, the sort of the, the street experience of being approached is, is like not great. Sure. Um, does the analytics tool start at the point of street sign up? Um, if it does, do canvases get scores? And then how do you like capture that data and use it to analyze behaviors and, and, and create a strategy? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So, you know, again, this is all about the data systems and it's complex. It's hard to move data really, really quickly. And so it's not instant, but it's pretty quick. So our, our canvassers use tablets. So the, all of that information is digitized, whereas it used to be on, on forms. And so, but that information first has to be cleansed. It has, the credit cards have to be processed. So within about three days is when we get that survey out. So I'd love it if it came out instantly. We're just not there yet. It's, you know, it, it's future state sort of thing where, you know, when we have a, a better way of transferring that data. So it's, it's pretty quickly after. And so we have scored, we absolutely have scored our, our canvassers. Um, the face-to-face -face business is, is very complex. You know, we do some contract because it's a very difficult business to scale, particularly in a country as big as Canada, not to mention two different languages. So um, it's, it's, we are somewhat dependent on the canvassing companies that we do hire to do that, but we certainly do provide feedback and scoring on uh, on those canvassers because, quite frankly, if somebody is being deceitful, we do not want them on our file. We don't want somebody being told this is not a monthly donation or it'll stop after three months or a year or that sort of thing. And we'd absolutely rather have somebody sign up, you know, one donor a day who stays on for two years and somebody signing up 10 that are leaving within three to six months. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Um, another one coming in, um, you referenced effort a few times. Where are you seeing the opportunity to reduce the perceived or actual effort of your donors? Well, definitely on our website. So we're in the middle of a big procurement. Well, we're just finishing the procurement process for our, we're calling our, our tech stack project. We're going to be using some new software to just take the money faster. Um, like it, it is a long process, you know, on our, on our website to take that money. We don't have a login, right? Like we don't have logins because again, you know, when you look at effort, if we're going to ask people to log in, that's extra effort, you know? And again, it's, it's, there are a lot of similarities between for-profit and non-profit organizations, mm -hmm. but one of them is, again, we're not giving away anything. So people don't have that same incentive to create a login like they do on, uh, on Amazon. So some of the software that we're going to be using on our, on our website, you know, very quickly takes the money like, almost instantly, you know, there's just mm -hmm. a couple of fields to fill in. It's very quick. It's automated. So uh, digitally is where we expect to see a lot of that effort reduced. Yeah, so with the donor experience, that effort has to be really even less than yeah. you know on, on, on in e-commerce, for example. Yeah. Like it still needs to seem legitimate that you know we're a legit yeah. company or organization taking money. But yeah, again, we just people don't want uh, you know to have to put in a lot of effort to give give their credit card and give us money. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Andrea. Thank you for submitting questions as well. It's really great to have some interaction. Um, I will just say we're coming up to time. So if you haven't had a chance to check out the amazing work that the Canadian Red Cross is doing, um, particular focus at the moment on the wildfires and a lot of effort has been going into that, but supporting communities all across Canada. Um, we do have this Benevity Matching campaign. Really appreciate your support with that. Thanks for joining us in the green room. Uh, Andrew, thank you very, very much for joining us today. Really appreciated hearing your insights about Pointerlist and all of the work that you're doing to make a more empathetic donor experience. So please tag, like, and share the green room and we'll see you next time. Thank you.